company. Thanks for being with me today. It's Anna through until 5.30. Uh, we have got Hootie and the Blowf- Blowfish on the way. Uh, we've got Jane Weedlin. We've got some Let Loose coming up as well. But right now on the show, um, you're going to meet Stephen Wiley. So Stephen is a gentleman from Northumberland who started an incredible dog sanctuary a while back. And what's different about it is that the dogs that Stephen ends up looking after with his team are are dogs that have suffered a lot of abuse and a lot of neglect and are not always easily rehomed. So it's a really, it's a tricky, tricky job. Um, And obviously, so many charities have had a tough time during lockdown and animal charities particularly have had a really tough time, as have animals. Um, So he had all of that to deal with during the pandemic. But on top of that, he decided to write a book about it as well. So he was managing the the sanctuary and writing a book. Uh, so we had a chat about the book and about the sanctuary and how it all began. Shaq was the first dog that I got when I was an adult and kind of left home and bought my own house. And I always tell the story. It was all the things that the parents tell you when you live with them, you know, things that cost money that you don't believe. Um, they do actually cost money. So yeah. things that, you know, if you put the shower on and go and watch MTV for an hour and then jump in the shower, you have just burnt a lot of electricity. <laughs> in. Tell my kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I sort of moved into my own house and suddenly realised that, um, you know, if I wanted a dog, I, I grew up with dogs and, and when I was younger. And if I wanted a dog, I owned the house. I could just go and get a dog, basically, and, and went into it totally naive. Um, went to the cat and dog shelter at Long Benton and picked up a scraggy sort of German Shepherd cross who um, who picked me really as I say um, yeah. and at the moment he just destroyed me house I had six months of, of everything everything that I was sort of trying to work for and improve the house he would I would come in and he would chew it the banister the front door the carpet um, I put those horrible sort of parquet floor in vinyl tiles down with the sticky back ones because he yeah. took the carpet and I came in the next day and he chewed those up. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was just we went through a lot a lot together. Um, and then sort of fast forward and seven and a half years later, I took him out for a walk one day and he collapsed um, with a thing called lymphoma. Yeah. Which was the answer of the, the lymph glands. And I'll be honest, I, I didn't take it very well. It was just such a shock and just, such a surprise and I think in the adult life it was the first time I'd lost somebody that was that had been really close and had been sort of my best pal for, for seven and a half years um, and out of those days for words never ever again I wasn't going to do it um, and here we are sort of you know, 14 years later I'm sitting with 45 in kennels and I currently have eight, eight of my own at home um, so you've got eight eight dogs of your own and 45 in the kennels now yeah. 45 in the kennels at the moment, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, for, for saying I would never do it again. But it just it just kind of, I, I, I had my own mobile phone business at the time and I sold that out to my partner. And um, it just seemed to be a path that just opened up in front of me. And, and obviously Shaq just seemed, which is what I called my dog, um, Shaq just seemed to be a, 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 the right thing to do in his memory, to be honest. And, and what does Shaq mean? Because it means something as well, doesn't it? It does. Well, again, that's a, a, a story. So we, people, when I started doing it, it was people, as soon as they realised you're involved in rescue and dogs, you know, cases like you, your little dog that you were just telling us about, people yeah. come to you and say, can you help us? Can you help us? So on the plus side of that, people would also come and donate money to say, oh, you help, you know, me mother with a dog, there's some money. So I wanted to do things properly. So I opened up, a, um, well, we became a registered charity, but I opened up a, a bank account as well that was a separate thing. Um, and it was, Pretty much still sort of sitting in the, in the bank where the girl asked us what Shaq stood for. And I, I, I literally just sort of mumbled the word safe, homes and kindness, which is what came out. And um, and that's what's kind of been renowned as, really, because it, it is very much a sanctuary rather than a, a rehoming charity. I mean, it's just giving some of, them, you know, some of the dogs that maybe won't go into home somewhere to go that they can actually call home themselves. We can only really take in just due to space, put to sleep cases. So it will be that a vet will ring us and say, I've got a dog in that, you know, is about to get put to sleep. Or it could be there's something like you say, something that if, if a dog warden turns up with a dog that's been very badly abused and, and, and things like that. So, yeah, it's given the dogs, I, I, I call it basically the, the dogs that nobody else will touch. They're not your, your easy rehomable ones. And just give them somewhere to go. And it, I was having a talk one day with somebody about a donkey sanctuary, I think it was. And, and the penny just dropped that why should a dog be under so much pressure to find a home? If it's suffered so much abuse, you know, yeah. we do it with donkeys, we do it with horses, we do it with whatever. Why should dogs be any different? And it was out of that that really just the idea came 
So there you go. Um, that's how Shaq started, Safe Homes and Kindness. Uh, and as I say, Stephen Wiley, if you just tuned us on BBC Radio Newcastle, uh, it's a gentleman that started that. He does incredible work up in Northumberland. I can't wait when this is all over. I want to go up and visit him. 48 dogs, did he say there, I think? Something like 48 and 8 of his own. Uh, but he's written a book as well, which we chatted about a lot. So we'll hear about that uh, in about the next 10 minutes or so. It's called Rescue in Lockdown. Um, phenomenal, though, to try and keep a place like that going during a pandemic and write a book at the same time. That's multitasking, it's finest, isn't it? Uh, Hootie and the Blowfish, and on the way, Marty will have all your latest North East news. It's Radio Newcastle, the sound of the North East. Uh, on BBC Radio Newcastle, it's the sound of the North East. I've got Let Loose coming up for you. Uh, I've got some pink, I've got some blondie as well. And from three o'clock, we'll be heading down memory lane together uh, on Time for Our Lives Part 2. But this afternoon, uh, my guest for you on BBC Radio Newcastle is Stephen Wiley. So Stephen started a, a dog sanctuary a while back called Shack, which was named after his his first dog, as he calls him, a little scruffy, a scruffy Als- Alsatian, a scruffy German shepherd. Uh, and bless him, he lost Shack, so he started a sanctuary. Um, and it stands for safe home and and kindness uh, and I think that's a lovely thing isn't it well he also as well as running the sanctuary during lockdown and well not during lockdown before the pandemic decided that he would write a book as well so a bit of a difficult situation trying to trying to run an animal sanctuary obviously in terms of kind of sorting out staff in terms of sorting out the animals in terms of funds coming in for all charities all across the board, the pandemic's been hard, but it's been really, really tough for him. So how on earth did you decide to write Rescue in Lockdown at the same time? We chatted about the book. People say, what do you do in your spare time? And I don't have a, a lot of spare time, obviously, with that many dogs, but I do I do write and I do kind of find do you know, be a little bit sort of creative with my time. And it, it was just something I was sitting listening to Boris Johnson's speech and obviously trying to absorb what it meant for the rescue because obviously... Unlike some businesses, it's, it, you know, we've thought every day is the same. So regardless of what Boris Johnson said on the 23rd of March, it was the next day we had to go in and, and, and deal with 45 dogs. So I, I was just sort of listening to it with, with sheer kind of shock and, and worry and all the emotions everybody was. And and, and and it's just something in my head thought you need to write down and keep a, a, a record of just what's going on. Um and then it just grew from that, to be honest. It just came, it was like, it was more like writing a diary. And obviously there's, there's some quite, you know, bad times in, in the book and things. And it, it, it just, it all helped with just dealing and, and coping with it, to be honest, just being able to get the words down and, and, and documenting what was actually happening and, and, and how we were getting through it, but also the effect it had on, on the world and everybody else that, that was, you know, unfortunately having to go through it. Yeah, and it was it's very interesting the way that you've done it because it's quite, at the beginning of the chapters, it's of the days, it's factual and you talk about what's been happening and how many cases of uh, of COVID there have been and how many people have died and it's it's very factual and you create, you know, there's a sense of drama which I think we all definitely felt at that point and which, you know, we, we are still feeling now. Yeah, it was something that was, uh, I didn't want it just to be another sort of dog book or, you know, that, Sort of kind of, I didn't want people to feel sorry for, for me or the rescue or the dogs. I wanted it to sort of record, like you said, like exactly what was going on. And I think it was such a shock, and, and still is when you look at the figures and the numbers, that it was, for me, that's what made it all so real. It wasn't the fact, you know, there was this virus and if you got it, you might be poor. It was that hundreds of people per day were dying from it. Yeah. And I thought it was very important that you, you, you got that across. And and also just to remember the people that had lost their lives and, and, and all the hard work, you know, NHS and everybody else was doing. I thought it was just important to try and document that it wasn't just us going through it. As I said, it was the, was the world. And hopefully, in, in you know, when this is long forgotten about, people will pick the book up and be able to go through and think, remember when that happened or remember this. And, you know, it was just a kind of record of what was, of how I was going through it, really, I guess, because it's not all about the dogs. There is my experiences with it as well and mental health and, everything else that I think everybody felt under those those trains. And in terms of the the charity itself and, and the amount of dogs that you've had to take in, how much did that change? Because you, you, you write about that, obviously, as well. Yeah, well, that was something that I found very, very difficult because although you had all this going on, you were still getting people to, um, you know, people ringing or emailing or whatever, asking you to take dogs. But we, we were just uh, sort of at our capacity, basically. So what we did was I, I, I stopped all volunteers coming in obviously to keep them safe as well, but to avoid the risk of infection coming in. And I um, split the paid staff, including myself, into two teams of three. Yeah. So we just did three days on, three days off. 
the staff and, and the people that were in did an amazing job and every single day we keep a tally of how many times the dogs have been out sort of twice and we're up to 260 odd days or something at the moment so even going through all that we still managed to get the dogs out for two walks I think everybody just pulled together and just tried to keep the dogs as safe as they could but it was it was very difficult because we just weren't in a position to to, to take any more in. And and I know it was your dad who sent a letter to tell us about the book. Is your dad very very proud of what you've done? He must be, Stephen. I would, uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think he thinks I'm mad at times, as a lot of people do. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean that was really nice to eat. He bought. Um, he actually took a little hand trying to edit because it it was all sort of self self-published and stuff so it was yeah he'd read it um and it's always quite a, a difficult thing to do to let somebody read it for the first time yeah it, personal. yeah and came back in with sort of you know being quite impressed with it so i think um when it was actually released he bought a few copies but i didn't know what he was doing well, he should be proud, uh, proud of everything he's doing. So if you just joined us on BBC Radio Newcastle, that is Stephen Wiley chatting about the book Rescue in Lockdown and all about Shaq, the incredible uh, dog sanctuary that he runs, which hopefully we'll get to at some point when things get back to normal. Um, I had a really nice tweet in, actually. He said, when my ageing pup of almost 17 years passed away in January, I donated her spare food, etc., to Shaq. I was really pleased to help. I'm certain Charlie would have been livid. I'm imagining that Charlie's the name of the doggy that you lost. Um, new pup setting in fantastically and it's wonderful to have a walking companion again. Uh, the Beagle Whisperer, thank you very much for sending that in. And I'm glad you found a new love with a new pup. Doesn't mean to say you forget your old love, just that you've got your new pup. Uh, this is Let Loose and Crazy for you. 18 minutes to three right now. It's Radio Newcastle. It's the sound of the Northeast. I've got pink on the way for you next. Mm-hmm.